Hey everybody, welcome to Should I Love with Jason Stewart, that's me, and my guest, Damian Pelliccioni. I'm saying it right? Pelliccioni. Pelliccioni? Yeah. I did I add an extra syllable? That's Pelli okay, you said it the American way. Oh, is that what I did? Yeah. Okay. Well, I've, been, I've only known him around uh, 15 years, so I'm, I'm almost, almost right on the pronunciation <laughs> of his name. Um, and Damian is my first CEO. Yeah. Uh, I met you around... I'd say, I think, 12 years ago, probably, 12, More 13. Than that. This was 2005, 2006. Right, and now it's 2018. So I met you when you were young in town, and you yeah. had just guest starred on a couple of episodes of a show called... The Gilmore Girls. Yes. Yeah. And you played the... Lance, the party planner. Right. The gay party planner. And I met you at the SAG... Uh, LGBT committee, the beginning yeah. of that, and you became a member of the committee for yeah. a number of years. Yeah. And you pursued an acting career, and you asked me to mentor you. Yep. Which is uh, what sort of happened until you just didn't listen to a word I said. <laughs> and then you're, you know, it's so funny because I talked to so many people, uh, and I've mentored so many people, which you know, starting around the same time that I met you yeah. through the, uh, LifeWorks mentoring program, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, straight people and Paul Laya and other, you know, my friend Danny R, and all this, all these other people that I've met who are now my all my friends, and you're the first person that's gone into doing something different. Yes, but still stayed within. Yes, it stayed in the business. And, oh, definitely, definitely stayed yeah. in the business. But I, uh, I like to say, I like to say that I evolved over time. Um, from acting, I got into producing, and from producing, I got into technology. Um, but entertainment and technology, that cross-section just always interests me. And social media and obviously digital. You started talking about it before people really were really interested in even hearing you. Yeah. And I remember when I would see you talk about it with people, people, they would just look at you and you would, you were, also you talked so fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you did, you did American Dreams, you did uh, Kissing Cousins, which was, uh, you, you even recently were in the Coffee Cross, uh, Coffee House Coffee Co House Chronicles. Coffee Stuart House Chronicles, Stuart Wade, Wade who, uh, yeah. this is sort of a, a derivative of his film Coffee Day, which I did yeah. in 2006, I believe. Wow. And so you still have your hand in acting a little, you're still hosting stuff. Uh, no, you know, it's so funny. Uh, when I did Coffee House Chronicles, that was two years ago. No, three years ago. Uh, and that was the first time I had acted in quite some time. And Stuart asked me to kind of be a guest on one of the episodes. And it was so much fun. But I really hadn't done anything in a while. And I got to work with um, some great folks uh, on his crew. But, um, um, and host, I was hosting at the time. I was doing my YouTube channel, Boys in Tech. Uh, which I have stopped doing. Um, you know, my life has evolved, as I like to say, and it's taken, I think, a bigger purpose, a bigger uh, iteration in life to uh, to reverie. So, are you cool about not? Because I remember a while you weren't. You were saying, "I'm still acting. I'm still doing this. I'm still hosting." Oh, I'm not anymore. No, I'm absolutely not. I've you now. I utilize those skills for what I like to think a greater good. Uh, in terms of my purpose in life, I'm just talking to, you know, where I think um, uh, my skills are better used, uh, you know, from learning how to be an actor and producer and, and business and technology to now running a team of 15 people uh, at Glendale Studios uh, at the Reverie headquarters. Wow. Yeah. I think it's really exciting. And I think it, what happens is you're from Canada yeah. And I, I, I meet a lot of people when they're young and they go, God, I want to be a chivalist. I want to be an actor. I want to be a singer. I want to be a comedian. And I think, that, and I say, why do you want to do this? And they said, because I love it and I have to do it. Yeah. And then I think, okay, have you ever acted before? Not really. I did some school plays. Well, have you ever done a film? Not, not yet, but I know that this is my path. And I think to myself that most people see themselves in that way because when you see a movie or you see a TV show or a play or see someone do stand up or sing a song, you see what's in front. You don't see all the elements that puts that together so you can see this performance. And there's a lot of creative, wonderful things that one can do that are in this industry that we all love that isn't being in front camera, of the camera. In front of the camera, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've experienced it producing. I produced a little. I mentor and, you know. Directed a bit, yeah. yeah. But I have to say, even stand-up, I have a very successful stand-up career. I still feel acting is, I'm a, I'm a lifer. That seems to be yeah. my... Whenever things get rough or I just I don't feel like I'm in the right place, I go, what do I really want to do? And I always say, I want to act. You know, it's funny. I was listening to Dolly Parton in an interview uh, that she was talking about 
uh, actually not talking about Donald Trump. Uh, and it was really interesting because she didn't refer to herself as a singer or an actress. She referred to herself as an entertainer. Uh -huh. And it's so funny because anytime I look at you, Jason, it's like you're so great. You know, when you're doing your stand-up, you're so, you've led people, you've mentored people, you've directed, you've produced. I, like, I feel like the acting is a huge part of who you are. But if I had to describe you, I would say that you are the be-all, end-all entertainer. Well, uh, see, I don't feel, I never felt like that. It's like, really? it's like Barbara Streisand will say, she's an actress first. Shirley MacLaine will say, yeah. she's a dancer first. Yeah. Everything comes from being an actor, an actor. for me. It's all the, it's, it's where the, it's where my roots are. It's yeah. who I am. And you're so good at it. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> so tell me, you have started a company called Reverie. Now, my yeah. fans are all different ages. Yep. So tell everybody what Reverie is. And it's R, yeah. spell it. Cause um, Reverie, R-E-V-R-Y, right. dot TV, T is in Tom, B is in Victor, Reverie, we made it very happy, is derived from actually Reverie, which is a fantastic or mystical idea, which we believed, you know, building this brand, building this network is. Um, Reverie is the world's first global LGBTQ streaming network. Um, no, can I, can I challenge yeah. you? Yeah. Okay, so Here TV mm -hmm. was the first gay network ever, mm -hmm. if I'm to be correct. Or maybe, no, I don't think it, it was. It was before Logo. It no, I think, I think Logo. there was another thing called Pride. Pride was, was Pride around before in Canada? Um, I don't know, similar absolutely. times. No, I don't think and so. And then, then we had one the here, we had QTV here, yeah. which started around the side. I don't know what, but I think that, I do think that here was the first in America. And here was a, uh, like HBO, that you would pay your five to ten dollars and you would get this extra channel on your uh, network. Or you, mm -hmm. that's the way it started. Yeah. And now here TV is on other channels yeah. like YouTube or Hulu. They have their section on it. That's the way it But feels. here's what's interesting you right. hit it over the head. Yeah. The first channel in America. We're the first channel globally. So there's a big difference between. But isn't having, everybody globally now? Now they are, but we were the first channel globally. Uh -huh. We were born in digital, born globally, and uh -huh. still today, we are in over 100 plus countries without spending a single dollar outside the United States on marketing. And that's from discovery of just our channel, our network, content that lives on the app. We hold the largest LGBTQ library of content in the world, both short form and long form. We have the largest LGBTQ original podcast network. And now we're proud to say that we have the largest LGBTQ indie music artist collection. We hold over 75 queer music artists from across the globe in our collection that you can find on any of our apps. Wow. Yeah. And people can people also listen to it on their computer? Yeah. Watch it? So Reverie... You can go to the website also. Go, here's the funny. You can find it on... So if you're an older person and you don't want to deal with it on your... <laughs> if you don't want to listen on your phone yeah. and you want to sit in your house yeah. or if you want to take it and watch the movie and have it be on your big screen because yep. you want to watch it on a big screen, you yeah. can also do that. You can watch it on what we call all screens from your iPad to your phone to your television to your laptop. You can find us on the web. You can find us uh, on... So it's like Netflix in a way. Kind of, yeah. And very much so. Similar to that model. Similar Just to, to tell people yeah, of course. to I mean, make it as simple is, we, as possible. We started off trying to be like the queer Netflix, but we've iterated to be so much different because we have short form content, because we have podcasts and music, which Netflix does not provide in their library, because we're a global streaming platform. And we're now not So you're on the net and you're on phone, so that means you can be eating. Nets, you can, Android, iOS, you can Apple be, TV, Chromecast, Roku, Amazon Fire, and we have a first linear channel, live channel, on the Pluto TV network, and we're proud to say we're announcing, and I'm announcing with you guys right now, a Zumo TV channel, we're launching a Verizon Channels channel, and we're launching um, on um, Zapping TV in Latin America. So we are going to be, by Q3, quarter three, which is July 1st, uh, will be available in over 70 million homes across the so world. So volume is your thing. Yeah. Is having as much choices as possible. Yeah. So in terms of an LGBT artist who would want to work with you, Mm -hmm. let's say pe those people are listeners because I've got a lot of fans that are yeah. LGBT artists. Yeah. How would they work with you and how would this, how would this help them? Yeah. So whether like you're somebody who's a music starting artist or a filmmaker or a content creator, we just call them somebody start, creators. Somebody who's starting yeah, out that's young that doesn't have a, a big name or, or does he just has made a great yeah. film or has a great podcast or made a great short or, sure. you know, 
Yeah, I mean, the easiest way is just to go to our website, reverie.tv, and we have an entire tab at the top that says submissions. You fill out the submission forms, and guess what? It goes directly to me, our content team, Dom Segetti, Chris Rodriguez, Leah so they, Daniels. So they decide. And they yeah. decide whether they like it or not. Yeah, so and we have then, a wonderful team of But curators. what happens? How, do they, how does their show or their... How do they become who they want to be through your network? How does that happen? Like... You know, when I was a kid, we'd have CBS, NBC, yeah. C, you know, ABC, and then they would promote those shows. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like once we decide on um, licensing or underwriting or co-producing, um, you know, any piece of content, and why I say any piece of content is because we're format agnostic. It can be short form or it can be long form. That's um, what's really cool is that we there, don't is no, there is yeah. no, uh, a short form, a short film doesn't have to be anything. It doesn't have no. to fit in anywhere to programming. It just Absolutely to, not. And no. a series can be... You know, six episodes, 20 episodes. Five eight minutes, episodes. 22 minutes, yeah. a full hour, two hours. Like, there is no... Uh, boundaries. There's no boundaries Which anymore. is really wonderful. You know, like, we're living in a world where you as a creator um, are only responsible for your own destiny. You know what I mean? My job as a CEO is to inspire investors, inspire creators, and inspire consumers to want to watch, invest, or create content with us. Um and this is where I think I have, you know, much bigger purpose now in life. Uh, and it's really heartwarming and exciting. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but to answer your question, you're getting directly to the source. Like when you submit something to us, there's no red tape of an agent, a manager, a development executive. You're talking directly to the decision makers because you have that access through that submissions page. Or so through you're sort following of like, me on LinkedIn like, like or Facebook. Uber. Yeah, yeah. You're like yeah. Uber. There's not well, hundred people in between. <laughs> you just get in the car. The guy gets paid. Uber gets a percentage, <laughs> and that's it. And we move on. And we go. Go to the next. And we go. Go to the next app. Next yeah. ride. Yeah, yeah. Um, who am I picking up? Right. Um, and and it is a ride. You know, I think that's the most exciting thing. It's like we promote the heck out of our creators. Um, we stand behind the work that we license, that we create, um, that we underwrite. Um, it's something that to us. Uh, we feel like we're creating a different environment and experience, both for the creator and the consumer. And what I mean by that is, you know, we represent all gender identities, um, all sexual orientations, all points of reference and cultural backgrounds, races and languages. We have the largest collection of queer content from China, 50 hours of Mandarin content. We have content from Brazil, from Russia, from India. We have them from all across the globe. Some amazing creators that I get to work with every day. Um, and no two of them are alike. So you speak Mandarin and Chinese. Um, no, we had someone in our team that spoke Mandarin and <laughs> helped translate that. Because you say you're talking to them every day and I want to know how you're doing uh, well, that, well, Google Translate helps. You Believe it or not, I was actually reading an email from a producer we're working with in, uh, in Sao Paulo in Brazil and he was speaking to another... Uh, this talent that we're working with, this musical artist uh, that we're talking to, really, and it's all in Portuguese and I have to use my Google Translate uh, to translate it. Wow. That's very, very exciting. I was just, I'm also my own technician, so I'm just looking at things. Yeah. Because um, I'm always thinking if I push a button, I'm going to turn us off. <laughs> um, and I have done it before. Should I Love is a two man operation. It's me and then my producer, uh, Scott Crawford. And this is a good time to do his, uh, little, my little commercial for our first sponsor. And this is for a new thing called Casa Crawford. So your home away from Chrome is in Silver Lake called Casa Crawford. It's in strolling distance for both Echo Park and Silver Lake. Casa Crawford is a perfect bed and breakfast. It's an Airbnb of sorts. It's a home away from home. It's three miles to downtown and Hollywood. You got your own large one bedroom and you get an original art on the walls and you have a gorgeous view of the Hollywood Hills. So call for a reservation now at 323 Six six four one six 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 four. That's six six. That's well three two three six six three, one six six four. And speak to Mr. Crawford. Hi, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Scott, so much for being our first sponsor. He's terrific. That's exciting. Oh yeah, I want to go to Casa Crawford. It's fun. You know, he's a big a traveler, and he's been an actor, and now he's a bit of a politician. Oh wow! And uh, he. Uh, has had some, uh, I shouldn't talk about, but he's had some interesting things happen in his life, and his house is filled with art from all around the world. And we actually taped Like Father in his house. Oh, he wow. Was, that, he was one of our producers on that. Cool. That's why, and I wanted the house to look like people who had traveled yeah. and spent their life traveling. It was one of the elements, and his house had all the artifacts of that. Yeah. Now, 
so tell me what's new and different now that's happening because I in the last year we haven't talked a lot. I know it's so since, busy since uh, <laughs> since the uh, uh, the the festival of sorts. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So tell me, you had a uh, it's the I guess it's the Out Web Festival. Out Web Fest is the world's first LGBTQ web festival. Right. Um, web fests are all over the world. Uh, I actually got to participate in Rio Web Fest this year, which is absolutely amazing. And it's harder though, don't yeah. you think? Web I find because when Mentor came out, mm -hmm. which was. Uh, Three years ago now, three yeah, or four years ago, yeah. it was very different. There was no place for web content because yeah. it's hard if a series is is mine. It was six, six episodes. It's sort of difficult to sort of are you going to show the first three? You're going to yeah. show all six? Can you break it up? Can you make a movie into it? Their mine was meant to be seen episodically, and I'm assuming that my problem was the same as a lot of people's problem. You'd see one episode, you really didn't know what was going on, and it wasn't the same as being able to see all of them. Because I remember going to Outfest and seeing the British version of Queer as Folk, and what was so exciting is we spent a whole afternoon watching almost a, a whole season. Oh wow! And it was like it was the first uh, binge I'd ever been on of a show. But yet the ending of it and it starting again was sort of exciting. Yeah. What's, you know, the idea that we could watch it episodically. Yeah. But to watch it as a film and put it together didn't work artistically, I thought, for mine. No, you know, it's interesting. I think so of WebFest as very much like short film festivals. Like it's the same thing. The difference is we're celebrating work that is distributed and created for the web. You know, and out WebFest, again, being the first LGBTQ web festival, we're partnered with Rio WebFest. We're working with so many different uh, Toronto WebFest, New York WebFest. We have sister WebFests all across the world. We're now in our third year. You know, WebFests are very new. The oldest WebFest, I think, is like five or six years old. Right. right. It's a brand new it's concept. That's what I mean. It's a new thing. It's, it's a, a new concept. It's yeah. sort of difficult because how you how to take content that should yeah. be seen. It would be like having a TV fest. Yeah, you know, exactly. Do you show one episode? Exactly. Of, one episode. Of, of, yeah. of, show, of The Walking Dead and then you yeah. just, you know, leave it and then that's yeah. it. I mean, and I think the great thing too is like with at WebFest, you know, we have great partners. We're partnered with YouTube Space LA. That's our opening night. We're coming back. We have the Reverie Visibility Awards. Um, we're going to be announcing our Vanguard Award winner very soon. Uh, and um, the rest of the festival will now take place in West Hollywood. It's May 18th through 20th. Um, we have amazing sponsors. All, all, all this stuff we're announcing in the next like couple of weeks, I wish I could tell you, but we're working on some big deals right now. Um, but it's really exciting because we have content creators coming from all over the world. We actually partnered with Rio WebFest this past November. I had the pleasure of going to Rio de Janeiro, speaking as a keynote speaker at Rio WebFest, which is an amazing like festival. Hugely well-received, great talented filmmakers there. Um, thousands and thousands yeah, of gorgeous people. place. Gorgeous place. To, it was my first time. Chris and I went. It was our first time in Brazil. Um, Rio Chris Rodriguez where, is your husband, and also yes, the, and also my co one of my three uh, fabulous co-founders. It's myself, Chris Rodriguez, Aaliyah J Daniels, and Lashawn McGee. And I always have to um, cite all four of us because I'm nothing without the three of them. I feel like I have a real husband and two work wives. And Aaliyah and LaShawn will say that they have two work husbands because uh, we spent so much time together. But we've you know, managed to build this business in just three short years. We're in our third year. Um, but, uh, but our WebFest, so partnered with Rio WebFest this year. And we selected this beautiful Afro-Brazilian lesbian drama called Septo. And we selected it to um, not just screen at Out WebFest, but we're flying out the director, Alice, to be part of Out WebFest. And Rio is coming to Out WebFest to select one selection this May to then fly them out and participate in Just Rio the WebFest in November. Damien is saying yeah. this is because very few uh, festivals fly anybody out yeah. for short content yeah, of course. anymore. And it, so it becomes, a, for the artist, it becomes a little bit of, uh, not a little, a lot of, an incredible amount of cost. Yeah, yeah. To, and that's the other thing, too, is like we're partnering with other web festivals now. We're in talks with about 10 others that we're hopefully going to be doing these exchange programs with. Rio really was the one that um, inspired us because they started the movement of kind of doing the exchanges. Um, as they called it, it was their golden ticket or the silver ticket. Silver ticket was another sister festival just selected the content to screen in their festival. The golden ticket was that plus a plane ticket and accommodations. So we decided to be part of the golden ticket. That experience alone was completely worth the cost of flying Alice out. Alice has never been to the United States. 
She comes from northern Brazil, which, you know, as an actress, writer, director, producer, um, is very limiting, especially being, um, you know, biracial. And um, specifically in her market, you know, she's played a maid named Maria a million times, and she's so sick of it. So that's why she created her own vehicle with Septo, which only released in Brazil and became a million plus, you know, huge overnight success on Facebook alone in Brazil. Proud to say that Reverie has purchased it as a new original piece. Septo is coming to Reverie, but we're going to launch it after Out Web Fest. Um, and this will be her first time in America. When I gave her that award at Rio, I have it on video, she was bawling on stage in front of 3,000 people. And that just warmed my heart because now I'm giving, again, this is like my greater gift and my purpose in life is to celebrate filmmakers like Alice. Let them have their opportunity, their moment in the sun to be part of something here in Los Angeles. You know, we sit in our backyard here in LA and we live in a bubble. We truly do. You know, one of the things that Reverie um, has really opened my eyes and my world to is the amount of discrimination and hate for LGBTQ people across the globe. You think it's bad in Kentucky or Indiana? You have no idea what it's like in Iraq or Saudi Arabia or Russia or South Africa. Um, we had a letter actually from a young boy in Iraq um, that came across our social media this past um, Christmas break. Um, and he discovered Reverie, didn't even know gay people existed. He thought he was the only person in the world. Saw gay films. So it's like 1950s there. Basically. Saw gay films for the first time on our app and said that we had saved his life because he had been contemplating suicide. Um, it breaks my heart to get letters like that. Um, it's so funny because you being your age, saying things Tomorrow's like, my birthday. I'm going to be 37 tomorrow. Oh, really? But you yeah. being your age, this yeah. is... this this seems the way you're saying it it seems like a new thing for you for me at my age and you know 25 years ago when i came out this was something that happened all the time to me yeah. right here in the united states so yeah. i went through the same thing that you're going through in other places yeah. but it's a new thing to you because i think that people your age for some reason it's not that you've forgotten or you don't it's just too close to you well I was it's lucky I didn't experience that I had very accepting parents but there's people here you know? that have yeah of course so many and I, and I yeah, think that totally. I think that this is an interesting yeah. conversation yeah as I uh, um, as I start because I'm creating a new series mm -hmm. and it, it, it about it's called 50 and it's about this exact thing the idea that people who have hit 50 have experienced a certain amount of time and it's so different, especially in the LGBTQ community. community. Yeah. Um, there's a different, uh, you know, you've been through something. Yeah. You understand the shoulders that you stand on right here, right in your own town where you could walk to the, you know, to the place. I live in Hollywood here. For those who don't know, you can walk to, uh, this, uh, it's called, uh, the triangle buildings. Yeah. And you can walk there and you can see, the LGBT people that live in that building yeah, that are here that have been through, you know, people so in the seventies and eighties and have, you know, that's why I've always had such a, a, a reverence for uh, people that are older, even if I've never been a fan of their work or not been a fan of the way they've handled it. You know, I always think that it's really important to uh, acknowledge what they've done. Yeah. You know, people say, well, I don't like this. I don't like that. This person was too much like this. This person was too much like that. They were too flamboyant or too masculine if they're a woman. All the, the stereotypes that we all tend... I said, well, that's that's who they are. And that's yeah. what they did at that time. And that's why we are here. Yeah. Because of them. Of course. And we forget that in our yeah. own city. I yeah. Think I, I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of stories to be told at all different age groups. You yeah. know, referee is very universal. So what's happening in the yeah. world happened here. Of course, it's everyone. Yeah. It's history repeating itself. Right, whereas in, Canada in is so much far beyond even yeah. us. Certainly yeah. in terms and, of and this social is where, terms. You, know, I you guys don't, were above us in terms of that, I think. You had everything. We were lucky. I was very lucky. But I mean, this is where I don't discredit, you know, what people have gone through or are going through even here in our own backyard. But what I think the perspective that Reverie's given me, at least in this position that I'm in today, is a greater understanding of the world and a greater understanding of the work that we still have to do oh it's big you know what i mean it's it's it we're lucky that we have you know marriage equality and that we have laws you know fingers crossed uh that won't be broken down 
um, by by certain administrations. I mean, yes. What's so funny is you could do a joke in your act and say, "Oh God, you know, you guys, if somebody oohs or ahs at something I say, I always say it doesn't matter." You know, Trump could kick me out of the country by Thursday. Of course. And then everybody laughs really loud. And you know that if people laugh really loud, that that's a group conscience. Yeah, of course. Of, of, of fear. Yeah. Of that and that could happen because, you know, we could lose our rights, you know, tomorrow. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could be deported to Canada. I mean, it's not unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so, but this is the thing. This is the work, the movement that we're trying to accomplish with Reverie is that you have a place to find yourself represented through media, positive depictions, you know, great work um, that's curated, as we like to call it. Curated? Curated entertainment. Um, that's curated through an amazing staff that I get to... It's so funny. Whenever you say day. the word queer, yeah. it still makes the... It makes it's the different. Hair, it well, still makes the, the hairs on the back of my neck. And you know what's interesting is... I don't love that word. I never have because right. it was not a positive word growing up. Right. And, it, and I understand that we now have that. Right. And it's we have to... catch all. It's the new generation. You got it started in the. I guess you, yeah. when I first heard it was when I did colleges in the nineties because it was in the colleges is where it started and it was like, oh god, you know. It's tough because you have that history of the word, and now the new generation has taken it back, right? And they're this and is straight how they want people to want to be called queer. They want to call. Right, they want to well, be there's allies. But yes, like, they want to be. They say, oh, I'm a queer ally. Yeah. And they're like, oh, great. Right. Now they're in. It too. You know, and I think the biggest thing too is when you look at the generations, right? Like millennials is the largest generation in the world, and millennials, twenty percent of them are LGBTQ. They identify as LGBTQ. Right. And they'll make up fifty percent of purchasing power in just two years globally. But Generation Z, the younger generation, ages ten to twenty, right? 52% of them will not declare a gender, will be non-binary, or fall under a queer... 52%? 52%. In the world? In the world. Ah, where'd you get we'll that? Where, okay, where'd, you get, where'd you get that? Okay, this is this yeah. is my new thing because yeah, of fake sure. news. Nope. Where did you get that? From? Williams Institute. The Williams Institute? Yes. Oh, so we did this a This is a global study. We did a thing at the... This is a yeah. study. Okay, so... But or will fall under a queer spectrum, right? Not LGBTQ because they don't like the labels. By 2030. So, so just to be clear, yeah. let's not go so by sure. and just throw some numbers <laughs> out because people are listening and yeah. I want them to know what mm -hmm. we're talking about. So, so this is through the Williams Institute at UCLA, which is a yeah. very substantial and place. There's, and Nielsen, there was four or five statistics. But it is a, a yeah. bit of queer centric at the Williams Institute, is it? Of course, not? yeah. But there's also Philip Picardi quoted this, the, the editor of Them and the mm -hmm. former editor of Teen Vogue in an article. Like there, these are found stats, not even just one institution. So when you say, before places. we rush by it so quickly, yeah. when you say 52% of Generation will, Z, of the, from 10 to 20, will not self-identify, is that in the world or just this country? World. In the world, just to world. be clear. Yeah. Will I not want to be a man or a woman or... Non-binary. Yeah. Yeah, or their sex, you know, whatever, their, not just their sex, but their orientation too. This is where like That's all these lot. lines are blurring. But here's how do they know that though? How do they know studies, that? studies, huh. statistics, and and through media. A lot of it is through media, right? Like how social I still media. Find that so, I still find that so hard to believe. Data is the world, right? I don't know if you have a Google Home or. But we did. Of, we did a through the Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. You're aware of this. We yeah, did a study through the Williams Institute mm -hmm. also on openly gay actors, and it was right before the trans thing just sort of came out. So there were very few trans yeah. people. To, or I think there were seven in the in the study, and a lot of the information was not positive. Mm -hmm. There were still people that felt that they uh, could basically trust people closer to them, like actors uh, or peers, but not uh, casting directors or mm -hmm. uh, d directors or their agents. They wouldn't want to spell that out to as much. And then they also felt that. Uh, they were more in fear. There was there was a lot of people in, still in fear, and this was done I think five years ago. Yeah, and I think now certainly it would be different because a lot has changed in five. So years. much has changed. But what's really interesting too. about about that study yeah. is by the time it came out, things had changed so much. That was our big. It took so long to do the study, and then it changed. And then it changed, yeah. so the study was no longer valid. So I'm guessing that this study of 52 percent maybe might even be more. But I find it interesting. You know, I can see women, but I. I, I I guess there are men. See, that but just... what is a woman though? That's there's no more definitions. It's all mm -hmm. blurred lines, especially for that younger generation. They don't want the label, right? And so, see, I like the label. It makes it right. easier. I can go, right. okay, I know what this is. I know what this is. 
but I could be a million different things in between. And I think that's the uh -huh. identity of the individual now. And this is where things like Reverie, we get to be on that cutting edge. We get to be on the forefront to lead that with them. It's fascinating. And this is what's really exciting. By 2030, Generation Z and Millennials will make up 75% of global purchasing power. Global purchasing power. Two generations. That'll be ages basically 15 to 45. By 2030, that's not that much time That's away. why my series is called 50. Yeah. Because and, we're cut off. Uh, well, yeah. We don't ask. They don't, yeah. People don't ask us. They I'm, don't I am what yeah. they call a zennial. I'm caught between Gen X and millennial. Uh -huh. But I'm in the upper cusp of millennial, early cusp of Does Gen Does that mean X. that they feel yeah. that people over a certain age are not going, 45, are not going to buy anything anymore? They won't purchase as many profit products simply by the sheer population of their their age demographic. Right? Oh, Millennials I was, I... make up more of the population, <coughs> bless you, and Generation Z will make up even more of the population than Millennials. It's, it's all numbers. It's economics. Oh, so it's by population. Yeah. Mm, it's interesting. So if you are a bigger generation, well, now you, you, I'm you at the tail, I'm way, more. way at the tail end of the baby boomers. And what's the one before baby boomers? Is... That, after that was, no, baby, there was the greatest generation, baby boomers, and Generation X. The greatest, you're on, I'm the greatest generation? No, you're not the greatest generation. You are, if you're Gen X, Gen X baby boomer, you're on the cusp. I'm right on the cusp, yeah. yeah. You were so, more Gen X. Oh, okay, interesting. You're more defiant. Oh, very much so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but, um, but this is what's interesting, right? When you look at those economics and you look at those generations but people how they're communicating, But right? do people worry about what's happening now? Of course they do. Oh, they do. Okay. Oh yeah, of course they do. That's a whole other. How do you do that though, with everybody right. going into the future and pulling from? How do you deal with what's happening right now? Because when studies are done, or the things that right. you're all doing through these numbers and talking mm -hmm. to people and these tech, these all these multiple choice touch points. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't seem. It doesn't seem to me. It's like the perfect way to do something because you don't really get to talk to anybody as much. Well, okay. Well, you're talking about communication. What the way those studies are done. Right. No. Um, I am not in statistics, so yeah. I, I'm not part of that study, right. so I can't speak to how yeah. the mechanics of a study runs. So you have to take your but, grain of salt with Right, you. of course. But what I'm doing is I'm following trends and stats uh -huh. as someone who's leading a movement through, move, uh, for, through media and obviously leading a business that has the opportunity to scale with our community. Right, So we're focusing on telling those stories as well as the older generations and how those older generations are basically um, inspiring the younger generations because there's a lot of crossover between the two. I think so. Um, great films like After Louis, right? After Louis was a great crossover between an older and a younger generation starring Alan Cumming, all set in New York. It was at all the festivals last year. Probably one of my favorite crossover pieces. Um, but it's that juxtaposition of the person in their 50s trying to teach the young millennial to understand the history of the AIDS movement and what it took to get to the place where they are as an artist living in New York. Mm -hmm. um, great, great film. I highly recommend watching it. Um, but the big thing, though, for Reverie is that we get to tell these stories on a global scale. We get to promote and market and be part of um, the evolution of content, right? And this is what's really exciting to me. This is why... I wake up every morning, I don't drink coffee, and everyone's like, whoa, your energy level's like way too high. Um, because I get the opportunity to um, engage with our consumers directly through social media. I get to engage with our content creators and be part of the development What's the process. hardest thing, though? What's the hardest thing about doing what you're doing? Uh, running a startup, managing personal time and, and uh, professional time. Unfortunately, oh, really? because Chris and I live together, and you know we are part of the business, it's hard to shut off. Uh, that's, I think, my biggest struggle, personally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, part of it is just passion, sure passion alone for what we're doing. But um, finding time to go to the gym or walking our dogs or going to yoga um, and not discussing work uh, is always the challenge. But we're able to do it. We're definitely doing it. We have great friends that support that. And, uh, you know, I'm just so lucky with the people that I get to work with. They're some of my best friends now. Nice. Yeah. But what's the new stuff? What's coming up? Yeah, so Reverie has a ton coming out. We announced a partnership with Funny or Die. Uh, we have a whole bunch of their But aren't content. they changing their... They changed their, their kind of... Some, there's yeah, some... just, just their whole... Um, their operation is kind of like, you know, pivoted a little bit. Just like right. all these media companies are doing. I think they're focusing more on their original content. Um, but don't quote me. Again, I don't work at They Funny don't or seem Die. as funny as they used to be. They're so funny. You know, they they're seem, really they're, funny. They're, 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 I thought that some of them were seemed there was some more 
uh, political messages. Uh -huh. I've been noticing on it because I've been watching it. Oh bit. my gosh, did you it's see changed. the Rose Bowl coverage with Will Ferrell and Anna Gosteyer? No, no. That was like my favorite thing. Okay, it was on, see. it was, on, can you know why? It wasn't on broadcast. It was streaming only on Amazon Prime Video. Okay. And you could watch their like off the wall caricature like commentary of the Rose Bowl. And people thought it was serious, but they were playing That's roles. That's so funny. He had like a bald cap on and a giant beard. Did they didn't know it was him? They, I think people knew it was him, but they weren't sure if it was like... That's hysterical. But it was all improv, and it was so funny. It was such a great piece, but you'd only, under, you'd only well, watch it. I've heard it that he wants streaming. to reinvent the channel. Yeah, yeah. Yet. I mean, every, here's the thing. Hollywood's reinventing itself. It's not just Funny or Die. Sure. It's Viacom. It's NBC. It's CBS. It's, it's HBO. It's Facebook. It's Hulu. It's uh, Netflix. No one has the answer. And the great thing, too, is that like the barriers are being broken down. You know, there's so many other streaming services like ours that follow different niche audiences. There's Black and Sexy TV for an African-American audience. There's Pongolo for Latin uh, audience. There is um, Blue Fever for a young female audience. Fam League, Garage Monkey. Um, oh my God, so many great streaming. Seed and Spark for the indie artist. You know, so many great streaming services that are available. Seed and Sparks, they... They do streaming. They have a subscription service. You can watch... Um, some of the films that were crowdfunded um, on a streaming service, an SVOD wow, streaming so subscription video. That. Yeah, it's so great. Emily Best is a good friend, and we just love everything that she do. We're actually all part of a, a mastermind group together. We get together once a month, all these CEOs and you know founders of these niche apps, so to speak, and we um, you know drink pizza and beer and talk about best practices in our business and kind of what's happening in the marketplace. It's um, what's it's a, the what's the thing that you learned from those meetings that you didn't know. I'm not alone. I'm not alone in the, in the journey of uh, a startup. I think that's the most comforting feeling is that... But you knew that. What didn't you know? Here's the thing. When you are starting a business, when you are an entrepreneur, as I like to say, a mediapreneur, you know, uh, it's it's your life. So we need a, basically a Damien uh, dictionary to all your <laughs> yeah. new words. Yeah, to uh, to decode my my uh, my um, my catchphrases or my short form. But um, uh, you know, it is it's something where you're so in it when you're running a startup that um, it can feel very lonely. I was actually told this by a good friend of mine, Barrett Goresi, a long time ago when I first started Reverie who is also a serial entertainment entrepreneur, told me, I hope you have a great therapist. And I immediately ran out and got a great therapist that I go to every week because you need that outlet, right? As someone who is in an executive role and who's running a team and is responsible for a great number of, of folks. Um, and, and, and so this, even this mastermind group that we've created, we, we get to vent. We get to talk about things that are great with our business, things that are bad with our business, get help and assistance and it's it's um you know through the group that uh i have now forged wonderful friendships with like-minded individuals who are going through the same experience i'm going through you know i think that's the biggest thing whether you're the kid in iraq or the ceo here in hollywood no one wants to feel alone in their journey so do you think that people are going to want to watch things in niche programming mm -hmm. still Oh, 100%. Much more than they would want to have an Amazon or a it's Hulu, an addition to which it. is more uh, all-encompassing. Right, but here's the difference. It's in addition to that. Mm -hmm. So we're not saying that you're going to give because up your logo, Amazon Prime logo account Logo and forever. here and yeah. the other ones have uh, basically are falling by the wayside in, in terms of the, their successes. I think it's a lot of it has to, right, It's been harder for them to adapt and to pivot. Because mm -hmm. when you think about it, when you build a business... Your TV seems to have been doing it on uh, YouTube and Hulu and Amazon Prime. They have their, they've had their successes right. there. Right, but, but, but here's, a, here's the difference. a standalone channel... It's more difficult. And know. I think the biggest thing is because when you build a business on a different model that existed 10, 15, 20 years ago, right. and now you have to iterate that business into a brand new model... It's not. It's very hard to pivot. It's hard to make that sharp U-turn on a freeway where you're going 100 miles a minute, and now you're in a standstill on the 405. How do you pivot? It's not easy. Mm -hmm. The difference with Reverie you, you've is that started we were that way. starting in digital. But it's now even in your th short life, mm -hmm. it's changed. Oh, it's changed. Of course, 
It's Because I think of, I only know it from my own web series. Yeah. And I think from the, starting the beginning of it. Two years you know, ago. It was, yeah. no, it was four. Yeah. Four years ago when I first did Mentor. Oh, when you did Mentor. I'm well, talking about I said every yeah. episode has to stay within five or ten minutes. Right. Because that's what people don't have the, that's what I, that you were told that by everyone. Yeah. And now, you know, as everything is being streamed in the last two oh. or three years, right after this had been done, people, there is no time limit. So that yeah. really changed. No. That was the biggest thing that I think it changed yeah. is the, and the way that I have been willing to watch my 80 year old mom now goes on Facebook and she watches it when you, the, the, when the videos come on yeah. and she watches all the videos. Of course she does. And before she didn't want yeah. to, you know, she'll watch the short videos, the news things and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think, and my, and my mom is a, an, an incredible big shopper. So whenever you say these things and I, I talk uh -huh. to her and her girl and her girlfriend, Iris, they are obsessed with shopping. Shopping online. Obsessed with it. Yeah. Of course. Oh, she, online in her scooter Going to Ross, going to wherever well, she's Well, one going. is an e-commerce store, which is kind she, of what we're She's both. Then, yeah. She can't, she's she, can't even, she can't even get out of a supermarket. We joke about it when we go shop, supermarket shopping. I, I wind up having one bag of food because I live alone. She also lives alone and has two bags of food. <laughs> I must eat more than her. I'm a man. She's a woman. But why, how does, why does she always have more stuff than me? Yeah. I don't understand it. <laughs> Maybe she needs her son to take her to the grocery store and she's afraid the next time you won't be there. But I take her all the time. <laughs> this has not changed. I know. That's funny. So it's, you know, so I, this idea as I get older and people probably listening is going, God, that guy's obsessed with being older. But this idea that we don't spend money is odd to me. No, this but, idea but here's the thing. We're it's no, not, longer... no, no, no. It's not. You have it wrong. I'm going to correct you. Please. It's not that I'm you don't learn. spend money. I want to learn. It's that you're a smaller demographic than the younger generations. There were more people having sex and popping out kids in the millennial generation, now even more in the Gen Z generation than your mom was. Yeah, but they don't have generation. any money to spend. They do. I. This is not my experience. I'm going to challenge you. So yeah. most of the kids, not your age, yeah. younger. Yeah. They are having the hardest time getting jobs. Most of them right. are still living with their parents. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many young guys hit me up all the time who don't have a car, who don't have a job, who are still living at home. Are these guys are meeting on Grindr? Oh, everywhere. <laughs> Honestly, sir, I'm not kidding. Everywhere that I'm meeting because I'm looking to I'm looking to find somebody. After, I just broke up recently. Uh -huh. So I am back on the apps looking to meet people. Maybe it's not the best place. No, I, yeah. you're wrong because Mr. Married Guy. <laughs> and I'm going to teach you now because okay, you don't yes. know. Yeah, you meet know. more people on an app than you would ever on a website. And the of reason is, is because there is an action taken from an app. Yeah. Whereas a website, it's something you sit in. It's more sedentary. Yeah. So I, I have met people for actual dates much more on yeah. uh, Scruff or Grinder or any of the uh, Daddy Hunt de any any of the websites that yeah. I have. And what's really weirdly interesting is I've always younger men are always hitting me up much more than guys my own uh -huh. age. And I'm getting off the subject, but um, I don't know where you're going with this. But uh, the uh, it's the idea that. That the, the uh, twenty something generation, yeah. what's their name? Millennials. The millennials. And then generation Z. They don't seem to have any money to but, buy. But here's the thing: if they're, they're, so, okay. so you can you can Hold keep on. marketing to them, yeah. but they're going to steal it they're, from you. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on, let me tell you this. Without even thinking, okay. they're stealing. Okay, but let me tell you this. Right? Okay, let me tell you this. I'll give a great. Do example. they think they steal it? No. no. They don't. Okay. Here's a great example. Okay, your mother, right, and her friends. Uh, spend more money than you do, right? Is that typical or not typical? Shopping? Shopping. I would say, well, I buy big purchases. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to buy an exercise bike again. Can my exercise right. thing again. My mother wouldn't buy that. It's right. Big... Too much money for her to spend at one so, time. Right. I yeah. buy bigger purchases than oh. she does. Okay. So maybe it evens out. Right. She... But how many of her friends are so still just around a new to wig, buy so. things? Right. How so many of her friends are still around to buy things versus how many friends are around... To buy things That's, at your age group. I, now let's multiply it again. By but the isn't the isn't the baby boomers, which is the generation after mine, aren't they the biggest generation? No, millennials are. So mine are. Oh, the one millennials are the mine. largest generation in the world. Are you a millennial, right? I'm at the top end. I'm the and only. I'm, what am I again? You're Gen X. I'm You're Gen at X. the top end of Gen X. Oh, before Gen X and baby boomers. Yeah, oh, interesting. So now, but here's what I'm trying to say. Huh. So sheer numbers, right? Imagine. The gay population of China. China just has the biggest population in the world, right? Whether or not they spend money, 
they're still going to be the most lucrative consumer because there's so many, there's so much volume, right? So because of the sheer mass of the amount of people who live in China, that is a very attractive demographic to target regardless of age or, or geographic location. So now you have that across the entire globe for a certain period, age group, the largest generation, the most amount of people, regardless of them having money, even if you get a $1 purchase from them, you have that a million times over the next generation gotcha. that only has a thousand. Gotcha. It's economics. Gotcha. Interesting. But it doesn't make you less relevant as a consumer. It just means, and here's the difference for the future. If you are a studio, if you are Evian Water, or if you are the Peloton bike that you're maybe looking at buying, right? You need to be able to appeal to the greatest good of con the greatest number of possible consumers for your brand, your studio, your product to actually exist and live, right? And where do they live? They live on social media. They live on content. They live in a totally different place than your mom going to the supermarket. Right. So and they live on apps. Whereas, yeah, we'll not even be able to taste our food anymore. We'll have to come through an app and be delivered on an app. How many, how, how, in a week, don't you order food from an app? No. But you I, have. I don't, I have ordered from the computer. Yeah, I have. I've okay, ordered. Same thing, but, e but I, but I don't, so I, 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 it would have to have been someplace that I used originally yeah. that I, that I, you know, that I got. Uber Eats, Grubhub, Seamless. Yeah. Yeah, any of them. Each twenty four. Right, I have to go to, first. You'd have to. I would go to the restaurant, and if I liked it, then I would use. And if them. any of you are listening, um, Jason would love for you to sponsor his podcast, and he'll start using the app. Oh, all, all the time. <laughs> there you go. We'll yes. find out who's doing the ad yeah. sales for. No, I'm very apps. open to doing. I don't feel yeah. stuck at all in in that. I'm. I, I just want to learn. You know, it'd be a great documentary, a short documentary. <laughs> You, if you had to live your entire life for, let's say, 72 hours with apps only, no computer, no phone, no television, no car, nothing, the only thing that you could do, eat, sleep, drink, transport, um, buy, whatever, was only through apps. Be, be buying a lot of clothes that probably wouldn't look good on me because I didn't get to try it on. <laughs> you that, can return them. That's the only thing. Yeah. I hate shopping, so I want to go in, buy it. You know, I'm, I'm a total straight guy. Imagine they send you a package of stuff and then you just return it in the next package. I like to go, but I like to try something on first because I think it's it a visceral experience. Well, then, and yeah. then after that, I can order these shirts. I love yeah. them because they fit me. Yeah. You know, and then I will order the same thing. Oh, box on Costco.com. <laughs> oh, God, Costco. Yeah. <laughs> no, let's not even talk about uh, any of those big brands. But, but if they're listening, Jason loves your your store, and yes. he would love for you to sponsor his. God, well, I am podcast. actually I go to Costco with my mom, you know. <laughs> and that's and she, where that's where you have the bigger shopping cart, I'm sure, than she does. No, it doesn't matter. She still she still we have buys never you. gone shopping, and for her to have less than me ever, <laughs> she can't seem to walk through a market. It's a disease. That's so funny. Well, it's like my grandmother used to shoplift it, so at least it's, <laughs> and she would say it's it's because it's too expensive, and then they, you know. Oh my God! I always used to think to myself, you know, that she would uh, be in prison someday and get arrested for this. It scared me as a kid, you know, because she shop. She was a kleptomaniac. I'm, yeah. I'm not kidding. Literally, your grandmother? Oh, big time! <laughs> and I'd say one guy, she'd be in prison with somebody. What are you in for? Rape? What are you in for? Murder? What are you in for? Just stealing these this brooch? It was very pretty. <laughs> You know, I have to have so funny. Well, this has been great. I really learned a lot, and I hope people do. And those of you who are artists out there know that you can uh, change your path at any moment and find out where the right place is for you. And that's sort of what this was about. Yeah. And please go to Reverie. And I have mentors on Reverie. Yes, and it is. so is uh, some of my other podcasts with yeah. uh, absolutely Jason Stewart. Mm -hmm. And I think something else is that I can't remember. We have, don't we have your short film? Not yet. You Not will. yet, but we will. You, you will. Yeah. You will. Right. You definitely will. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much. How can thank people you. contact you? Through, yeah, through... I'm just at reverie.tv, R E V R Y.tv. You can find all things Reverie there submissions, our contact info, bios, all that great stuff. Um, and if you totally forget his name, you forget the name of the yeah. place, <laughs> just go to jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T, and I will send you in the right direction. Thank you all very much for listening, and take care, everybody.